Hey everyone, welcome to the third meeting, uh, sorry, third talk for C++ Edinburgh. I'm Chris Sabella and I'm going to be taking you through uh, why learning C++ isn't difficult, it's teaching that's the trick. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get through quite a fair bit of this content. Just in case you don't know a few things about me, I come from Australia where we have a land where everything can kill you. Um, that includes sharks, dingoes, uh, snakes, spiders, sharks with freaking lasers. Um, but no, seriously guys, if you do go to Australia, especially in the summer, which is right now for Australia, put sunblock on because the sun is the most likely thing to kill you. I'm not joking. Um, I used to work for NASDAQ and I taught casually at the University of New South Wales, uh, which is the uni I attended. I taught C, C++ and most recently compilers. In case you're not aware, this is what the, the Australian flag looks like, but I decided that my union jack wasn't big enough. So I moved to Edinburgh to work for Codeplay. And I've also taught at CppCon. Uh, there was a class called Exploring the Standard Library. And so a lot of the content for today is going to be derived from my teaching experience. The agenda is gonna be why we teach, which is a bit about philosophy. It's the least connected section to C++, followed by what are we teaching, which we'll look at planning a curriculum a little bit and then move on to talking a little bit more about C++. We'll then dive into how this, uh, this talk is relevant to C++ when we talk about learning and teaching resources. Then we'll talk about tooling and what tools you ought to teach. Uh, then we'll talk about a little bit of content that you should be addressing and some content that you shouldn't be addressing. Uh, you will notice that I'm not going to be talking about who we're teaching. And the reason for that is because who you teach is not necessarily someone that I have taught. I have most of my experience uh, from an academic background where I teach university students. I've recently uh, done a bit of training with uh, professionals, but the people that I've taught uh, vastly draw from university rather than uh, the professional world. Uh, this talk will probably take about an hour and I'm going to be using what I call the traffic light question and answer system. That is when a slide is black, that means that I'm talking. When a slide is green, that means that you guys are free to ask questions, throw up points of discussion. We'll do that for a few minutes and then a slide will go red. When a slide is red, that means that whoever is talking is the last person to talk. You can get your, uh, all your points out, but that's it. You're the last person to talk and then uh, I'll have to move on to the next slide. So uh, before we move on, are there any questions? No? All right. <laughs> so why do we teach? So some of the reasons why I teach are um, some of the reasons why I teach are because it feels good. It's um, it's a great way to help pass on knowledge that I've learned. Maybe someone can learn from the from the hardships that I've faced. They won't have to go through the massive template errors that I've encountered along the way. Uh, raise your hand if you're a victim of that. So few hands. Um, uh, uh, so other people might teach because it's a part of their job and they're required to do it. But I honestly believe that the reason that we teach, or at least those of us who are volunteering to teach, and that includes if you work at a school, uh, is because we teach to learn. My philosophy is that you can't, <coughs> once you reach the peak of your position, the next way for you to progress is to pass on your knowledge. Because in order for you to pass on your knowledge, you're gonna have a student that's wanting, that will want to ask you questions. If a student's going to ask questions, they're going to eventually ask a question that you don't know the answer to. And this is something that I encounter in every single class that I give. I will always be asked a question that I don't know the answer to. And that's great, because that means that I need to now go and learn the answer to why they, uh, the answer to their question and why that is the case. So if that's a case of me writing a program to figure out the answer to their question, great, I learned how to write a new program. If that means I've got to read the standard, great, I learned something new about the technical, uh, technical details about C++. If it's an engineering question, then I learned something new about how to write a system. So th these are some of the reasons why I enjoy teaching, but I believe these are reasons all, that we all want to teach, even if it's something that you haven't actually explicitly recognized. Uh, another thing that I should point out, actually before we get to that one, another thing uh, we do is when we, uh, when we learn, we make mistakes. And that's something that even teachers need to acknowledge. Just because you're up at the front doesn't mean that you are infallible. 
and I've encountered teachers along the way, uh, both who have been teaching me and who I've worked with, who have believed that they, because they are up at the front, are the sole source of information, and as a result, they can't be faulted. And I've listened to lecture recordings where students have rightly pointed out things to the lecturer, and the lecturer has more or less overridden them from their position at the front as a figure of authority and said, no, this is the way it is. And that's not the case. The student was right. So just because you're up here, that doesn't mean that you are always going to be correct. And so what I encourage is if you are being challenged by a student, don't tell them that they're wrong. Instead, tell them that you'll get back to it. Back to it. Even, if even if you're 100% on this, get back to them. Uh, ask them to send you an email on the spot. And then what you do is you go away, you do a bit of research, and then you come back with the answer. Now, if, if it's a case of the sky, they're saying the sky is green and the sky is obviously not green, then you can do the demo on the spot. But if it's a case of you need to do a bit of research ahead of time to, before you can give them the answer, then go away and do that research. It means that your students are the ones that are going to be better off because they aren't going to be given myths. And that's something I'll be touching on a lot more later on. I'll be talking about myths and we'll have a few coding samples that you guys can try and spot the problems with. And there are quite a few problems. So the next thing is class reviews, and this one is important. It's extremely important that you get a student, so not a student, you get other people, your peers, to review your class. And I don't mean spending five minutes just going over your slides, 10 minutes before the lecture's due to happen. What I mean is you have hours and hours of reviewing because who are we teaching? When I said I wasn't going to address that, I'm not going to address that in great detail, but we are teaching people who are going to be writing low latency software for companies such as Google and Facebook. We're going to be teaching people who are going to write safety critical software for self-driving cars, for rockets. We're going to be teaching people who write operating systems. We're going to be teaching people who write uh, code for parallel systems like CodePlay. And on top of that, we're going, to be writing, we're going to be teaching people who are going to become teachers. If you help someone, you automatically become a teacher may not be your profession, but you're still teaching someone something. And those people that go on to be teachers are also going to be teaching people who will eventually find themselves in one of these industries. And I don't want my self-driving cars to be written by someone who doesn't know how to write good software, by someone who doesn't understand C++. You can't just say that C++ is C with a bit of extra stuff sprinkled on top. And so you need to spend as much time investing in reviewing your class as you do actually developing it. And you don't give it to one or two people, you need to give it to as many people as you possibly can outside of your company, outside of your industry. I mean, for example, um, if you work on stuff at CodePlay and you're developing a course, give it to someone who doesn't work in the safety critical area or the parallel area. Give it to someone who works on, uh, on databases, for example, and get their input as well, because they will be able to offer some sort of contribution. So in review, uh, we talked about uh, reviewing classes and what, and what our audience can get from that. And other than that, we also make mistakes. And finally, we teach to learn. Does anyone want to uh, weigh in on these pieces? <coughs> yep. I thought your point about not being an authority figure at the front was very important given that a lot of the people you're talking to are going to be developing imposter syndrome. If you make it seem like you have to be a, a master before you can even ask a question, they won't ask questions. They will sit at the back thinking everyone knows what's going on apart from me, and they will not get better. And you will reinforce that by that behavior. So, very good point. I really like that, and thank you for bringing up imposter syndrome, because that's something I did forget. That's sort of the, the opposite side of the coin to arguing from authority, if I'm not mistaken. So, thank you. Uh, is there anyone else that wants to, uh, to weigh in? No? Okay. So, what are we teaching? Well, obviously we're teaching C++. But I think we should stop for a moment and talk about our learning objectives. Now, don't read the text on the slide. If you want to read this text, then get the slides from your offline. Uh, there's a massive amount of text there. But essentially, this is a set of learning objectives. And a learning objective is something that a lot of courses will kind of throw about. And now they're sort of like the goals for what you want to teach. 
and I pulled these from my high school syllabus for software development. These objectives are far more thorough than any university course set of objectives that I took. Uh, so essentially what we're doing is we're working out what we want our students to, uh, to develop. And these objectives here are essentially that I want students to learn C++. This is for a very general C++ course that I'm uh, looking at developing. And essentially what they say is that I want a software en I want to develop a software engineer out of you. I want you to go away and be able to write software, not to go and write C++. The course that I taught at my university on C++ was teaching language features. And while that's okay, because there's a bigger program that taught you how to be a software engineer, I felt that it could, there could always be a little bit more that we could have gotten out of it. And we could have taught them how to build systems using C++ rather than how to use C++. It's great that you know how to use Unique Pointer, but if you don't know when to use it or where it's appropriate, then that's not okay. And it's okay to know that uh, std list exists if you know it exists, congratulations, but that doesn't fit into the bigger picture. It's okay if you know that, um, if, if you know that variant is there, but unless you can fit that into what you're working on, then again, it's a piece of useless knowledge. Our value references are no different. What you need to do is you need to work out how to integrate all this stuff together. And so following learning objectives, which talks about what you want a student to develop from your course, you need to move on to learning outcomes. And this is where the real fun begins, because what you do is you take each learning objective and then you transform it into a series of things that you want your students to learn, to be able to do. So from this, for example, I've said that a student should be able to develop knowledge and understanding about how software engineers build systems. That seems something pretty concrete. But then I've gone on to say that they need to be able to choose the correct data structures, the correct algorithms, the correct libraries for engineering software. They should be able to use the right tools. I've then gone on to say that they should consult the most appropriate resources for building a program. If you don't know how to build something, then where do you go? And I know this slide isn't green, but if people want to just raise their hands and tell me a few of their, resor their preferred resources online, then I'd be more than happy to accept them. So yep, CPP reference. Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow. These are tools that people know that exist, but only after they've been told about them. And these are also tools that I think you should put into your course to let people know, hey, they're there. You can use them and no one's going to shoot you. CPPpatterns.com. <laughs> um, so, the, the, I mean, you, you can continue going down and there's more and more of these. Um, I think the largest set of... Uh, learning outcomes that I have is about five bullet points for just one of these learning objectives. Uh, so the next thing we should probably address is what is C++? Now what's going to happen is we're going to have a few statements appear on screen and um, they may be a bit triggering and if you do feel you need to leave the room, please do. Um, you are allowed to raise your hand once the slide goes green. I just want to put that there. So what is C++? C++ is C with classes. Now, before you all get upset, I want to ask a question. How many of you in the room know the English language? Please raise your hand if you know the English language. Given that we're in Scotland, I hope everyone's hands up because that's part of uh, Britain. Now, no, please keep your hand up, please keep your hand up. I now want to ask a second question. How many of you know uh, German? Okay, now of those of you who know German, please keep your hand up if you learnt German before you learnt English. Now of those of you with your hands up, I think there's only two hands left. If you learnt German before you learnt English, please keep your hand up if you learnt German before you learnt English solely to learn English because German is the predecessor to English. No hands. Now, let's go back to this one here. Raise your hand if you know C++. To some degree. Now, keep your hand up if you know, if you know C or you learnt C before you learnt C++. Now, please keep your hand up if you learnt C before you learnt C++ solely to learn C++. 
there's still a few hands. That is not the correct way to teach C++. <laughs> that is a very bad way to teach C++ because what happens is we introduce things that are unique to C into our C++ programming or things that C++ has uh, abandoned and said, this particular feature is not a good way to do this. This particular idiom is not a good way to, uh, to use C++. We have other mechanisms. <laughs> Thank you, Windows. Um, for example, using raw arrays. In C++, we don't do that. We use vector. We don't use a raw array. But one of the very first things that C programmers learn about are raw arrays. And we'll talk more about raw arrays in just a moment. Um, but the way I, I, I like to think of C++ is that in this case, it's English. It's big. It can be complex. It can also be simple. And it's based on something else that some people may argue is a bit more elegant. It may not be, depending on who you talk with. But you don't learn one before the other just because this one came first. Who here learnt C before they learnt C++? Please raise your hand again. How many of you know Simula, which C++ is also based off? No one. Everyone talks about how C is based off, sorry, C++ is based off C, and therefore we should learn C first. No one ever mentions that it's also based off Simula, and we should learn Simula before we learn C++. No one does. I've never seen that argument before. So please do not make this statement, because it's not true. C++ is low-level Java, and I'm not kidding. A student once tried to convince me that uh, C++ was a superset of Java just because it had curly braces, had the word new, it had uh, semicolons at the end. It had a, a, a range of features that kind of felt similar, so people have tried to convince me of this. I also watch students who come from Java. That's my, my background. It's mainly training Java students because UNSW is mostly a Java university and taking them from Java and a C background into C++. I have to watch people write what appears to be low-level Java before they become a, uh, a competent C++ programmer. And this doesn't really work out well once you start showing them things like shared pointer, because then they'll start using shared pointer over other tools because it feels more like Java. If you want to start teaching C++, what you need to do is you need to convince your audience that this language, like the other languages, is unique. You don't, just because it feels similar, doesn't mean that it is similar. When you teach another language, you don't go, oh look, it's, when you, when you teach Java, you don't go, oh look, there are semicolons and braces like C. You talk about what makes Java unique. You talk about what makes C sharp unique. You talk about what makes C unique. We need to start doing the same thing for C++. We can't keep comparing it to other languages. So on that, let's move on to something that doesn't use another language's terms. C++ is a low-level language. Can I get a show of hands for people who think this is true? Okay, there's sufficiently fewer hands than I expected. A few halfway be hands. It's not. It's not a low-level language at all. It's a language that lets you do low-level things. You can go down and do the low-level stuff, but even C is a high-level language. And when I say high-level language, I mean for some definition of high. I haven't actually specified what that means. But I would argue that a low-level language is something that lets you directly control your architecture, something that lets you directly manipulate the implementation. C++ lets you do that, but it has so many extra layers of abstraction that that is just a feature of the language rather than an actual selling point of it. And so if you say this, then it's going to scare away a lot of people. When I was at uni, I, was, I overheard a student who was taking an embedded systems course because it was a part of their curriculum, not because they chose to. They were never going to touch anything to do with C, C++, or assembly ever again because they were scared off by the term low level. So let's move on to something a little bit more, uh, shall we say, generic. Uh, C++ is a high level general purpose multi-paradigm programming language. This is what Wikipedia classifies C++ as. Who would argue that this is, if not a complete definition of C++, something that captures a lot of what C++ says? Okay, yeah, that's reasonably what I was expecting for a show of hands. I think, it, I think that also. I think it's a mouthful. And I also think that this is a great way to scare people off. 
because we have high level as a term, we have general purpose as a term, we have multi-paradigm as a term, and we have programming language as a term. That's one, two, three, four terms on top of learning C++. And so if you say all these things at once and you've got a C++ novice, then you're going to scare away someone. I mean, if, if someone told me this is what C++ is, I'm just going, uh-huh, yep, high level, general purpose, uh-huh, multi-paradigm, I don't know what that means, but just whatever gets the ball rolling so I can see some code. Oh, it's a programming language, I know what that means. So while I like this, I think it's a bit, if you're, int if you're introducing someone to C++, and I think there was someone in the room that said there are, they've just started learning C++, if you were shown this on day one, would that have... Uh, I'd have come back on day two. You would have come back on day two? Would that, a lot of those terms have glossed over you? Uh, it made me think more of the reputation of C++. Sure, that's what we're trying to avoid here. <laughs> so the, uh, the answer was that it make, uh, make the person think more about the reputation of C++, which at the moment needs a bit of repairing because it's no longer true. And it hasn't been true since the 90s. So I like this definition. <laughs> C++ is a programming language. That's not the full definition. That's where we start. We explain what, a what it means to be a programming language and why a programming, programming language exists, what they do. Computers are dumb, we need to instruct them on how to do things. Then we move on to say that it offers the right abstractions at the right time. We don't go any further than that. We just explain what it means to be a programming language and what it means to have abstractions because anyone who learns programming needs to know what an abstraction is. If you're coming from another language, you know what an abstraction is, but you don't have to worry about all the fancy details until you actually come to them. And by that point, you will be able to agree with this statement when you go onto Wikipedia and eventually research the language that you're going to be uh, using. So, in summary for this section, I say that we ought to provide a correct definition for C++. We should provide some solid, comprehensive learning outcomes for your students to be able to check boxes and for you to have a set of guidelines for, to teach. Those should be derived from learning objectives, which are your goals. And finally, I'm going to open the floor to questions and points of discussion. Simon. So, the distinct point on low level versus high level. So, is, is x86 a high level language because registers are just an abstraction and instructions are just an abstraction? They're not directly controlling the underlying hardware? That I think is going a bit too low level. <laughs> uh, the, the question was uh, is uh, because we have. Uh, registers and they're an abstraction over something and we have instructions which are an abstraction uh, does that make x86 a high level language and the answer is for some definition of high level no uh, that because we can't go any further than x86 unless you want to go to microcode which I'm not an electrical engineer so I don't care about that uh, that's the lowest level that we can go to and that's where the term low level would in theory apply does that answer the question okay does anyone else want to uh, discuss some points? So the question was that we, uh, sorry, what's your name? Yeah. Jim? Tim. So Tim has said that he's, he's seen people come from, um, from assembly and from C and move into C++, but he's also seen people come from Java and Python into C++ and they tend to struggle with pointers. And in answer to the question, which I will address in a little bit again, um, but I do want to address this because this is a point that um, there's particularly, um, well, it's, it's, a, it's a tough point because uh, essentially, the course that I taught, taught pointers on day one. And I was very much against that because pointers are the quote, scary unquote, thing about C++. And yes, understanding how pointers work is essential to learn. It's not essential in day one or week one. And if you have time, push it past month one. Uh, try and push it back <coughs> as far as you can, but not too far. There are things that do need to be taught after pointers, but, um, Eventually, people will get pointers once they're exposed to other things and they're confident in the language. You need to build up confidence before you can start talking about this extra syntax. And there is a YouTube video now. It was a talk done by a 
lady named Kate Gregory at CPPCon called Stop Teaching C. And it's with respect to C++. And so what she's done is she's worked out a, a spot to place where to teach pointers. And that's, um, I think she said, after iterators, which are a part of the standard library. We'll come back to that when I get to the uh, what to address section and what to avoid section. Um, but essentially, you don't need to do it like that if it doesn't fit your model. If you can't do it at that point, then don't do it there. But don't show them very early on because pointers don't reflect C++ as much as they reflect C. We have things that we can abstract away. For example, uh, we have vector, which replaces dynamically allocating arrays. We have, uh, we have uh, things like map, which can be in place of a binary tree. Uh, so we have these extra tools that allow us to push pointers further back in, in the chain of when to learn things. Does that answer the question? Sure. And did I see a hand there as well? I was going to make the point that really you want to be teaching references um, well before you teach pointers. Yes, exactly. Um, if you do want to teach pointers, you can give somebody a unique pointer, a shared pointer. You don't need to start saying, and here's how pointer arithmetic works. That's something I don't do very often, and, and you don't need to know it. Yes. So most the. Things. Sorry? You don't need it for most things. You Absolutely. Point, uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the extra comments were. Uh, essentially to teach references long before you teach you teach pointers and that's absolutely correct and even when you're talking polymorphism as in runtime polymorphism teach with references not with pointers that comes from uh, Kate Gregory not from me uh, but it works it really does work and when my students who were being taught pointers and runtime polymorphism in lectures came to the tutorials and I started showing them uh, how to do it with references they all started understanding how runtime polymorphism worked in C++ so, are there any other questions or uh, points of discussion? Duncan. This may go too off topic, but how do you explain what a reference is if you're not explaining what a pointer is? So, the way in which I like to explain it is that you... <coughs> whoop. The way in which I like to explain it is that you, um, you show them a function and you explain how to pass things by value. And so you go down to the function and you do some stuff and then you modify one of the, vari uh, one of the parameters and then you, when you leave the function, you go, oh no, it's still the same thing as it was when we passed it in. How do we fix that? And so then you add on a little ampersand and we have an L value reference and we don't call it an L value reference, we just call it a reference. And then what we do is uh, we modify it and then when we go out, we, we, we put it to the, uh, the character output and we show them that it's modified. And so we talk about references like that. And then we say, well, okay, what about when we want to copy a string? Uh, so when we, what about when we want to use a string? If we're passing by value and it's creating a brand new string, well, that's not exactly what we want to do. We just wanted the same character sequence. Well, now what we do is we have a reference to constant strings. And then that's how we, uh, how we introduce reference to cons. And so we talk about references there uh, through that sort of uh, level of indirection. And then we, uh, when we talk about uh, polymorphism, runtime polymorphism, then we can use references to show how that works as well. Does that answer the question about uh, how to introduce references without pointers? Sure. I, feel, um, I guess my original question is that there's still an underlying, like, oh, it didn't work, so I just put an, we're getting off topic, but you know, like, oh, it didn't work, so I put an ampersand in, and, and now it works. But, because there's no explanation of the mechanism, I guess is what I'm saying. So what you would then say is that you, you say that it's an alias or a nickname or it's, it's actually the object, it's just that we're now having to name it something else for this particular use of the function. And you, you address any questions on the spot. Say on that front, I've taught people things like stood string. Yep. No one asks, how does this work under the hood? It's just intuitive and obvious and people don't even think about how it works. Yep. So the, later they might and then they'll be a bit scared. But <laughs> <laughs> so the, the remark was that um, that when, pe uh, when people are shown uh, std string, they don't qu immediately question how things are working on, uh, underneath. They just accept that it works and then move on to using it, which is one of the great things about C++. And I think I addressed that in the next section or the section after that. Uh, but it's great that you mentioned that. So, are there any other questions? No? Good. <laughs> so, learning and teaching resources. And this is probably my favorite section. It's going to be your least favorite section. So we're going to talk about books first. There are very many bad C++ books out there. 
And we're not talking about bad style, but things like spotting, sporting glaringly obvious factual errors and promoting abysmally bad programming styles. This description probably covers your favourite C++ book. Does anyone know where this quote is from? If you do, just raise your hand. Rachel? No, it's, or oh, actually I don't know if he wrote it, but that's, I didn't pull it from uh, Bianca's website. Which is probably, if he put it up there, then that would have been a conflict of interest, I think, because he does sell four books. Um, and he's the editor, I think, for a book series. No, it, it comes from the def Stack Overflow definitive C++ book card and list. And it may feel like an, uh, like an elitist sort of quote, but it is 100% accurate. The number of C++ books that I have skimmed through uh, or have read and thought were good at the time and then come to a better book um, is just absolutely amazing. I've looked at courses that reflect things like this. And if a, so for example, if a book claims that they can teach you C++ in a month, then I'm sorry, but that book is terrible. And there are books that I've read that are like that. And one of the very first things that they do after teaching you how to use integers and how to use uh, floating point numbers, and they talk about the sizes, what those integers can store, and all the different things about uh, long versus long, long versus float versus double versus long double. Um, after they've listed all these kinds of things, they then move on to pointers, which we've just said should not come really early on for novices. And so th this is something that really strikes at home because one, that, was, uh, that was the d definition of one of my very first C++ books. And some engineers have, uh, have succeeded from these sorts of books. A lot of my colleagues have read books like this and gone on to be great engineers. It doesn't mean that this book is good. What it means is that they've had, good, they've had positive experiences whilst programming. They have, may have had good mentors. They may have had uh, really good uh, situations where they've been able to learn. They've had good code reviewers and they've learned along the way. But these books on, the, on their own aren't good. And you can't just say, well, I learned from this book and I'm a good engineer, so therefore... Uh, this book's okay, you need to study other books in order to say, yes, this book is good, or yes, this book, or no, this book is terrible and should be, should be used as something to keep my fire roasting during the winter or as a stand for my monitor, which is actually what I do now. I take bad C++ books and stick them under my monitor. So, I like this book. Bianca calls it the Swan Book, but it's called Programming Principles and Practices using C++. It's the second edition, and it talks about how to write software. Using C++ is just a side effect of using this book, but it's an absolutely amazing book at teaching you how to use, sorry, how to write software, not how to use C++, which is a theme that I was talking about earlier on. You don't teach people C++, you have to have some sort of uh, bigger picture when you're talking about C++. And this book is for novices. So if you're not a novice and you don't, and you don't want to spend uh, time reading this book, that's okay. I have a solution. A tour of C++. Also written by Bjarne, but this book is 200 pages, which is about a fifth the size of this one here on the, on the right. And you can read that in an afternoon. I've read it in an afternoon. And so... If you don't want to spend time, so if you, if you think this book is not for you, then what you do is you read a tour of C++. And then immediately after you finish reading a tour of C++ for the first time, and you will be reading it more than once because uh, all you're going to get is a snapshot of the things that C++ has to offer. It will not teach you C++. What it will do is it will expose you to what you are going to be learning along the way. So after you finish a tour of C++, then what you do is you go out and you buy Programming Principles and Practices <laughs> using C++, second edition. And... So the Swan book is where you're going to learn C++, not a tour of C++. This is just what you do to remind yourself, oh, there are other things to come. This is, or it could be like a, a mini reference. You're not going to learn C++ from it. You might be able to um, fake your way through an interview, but that's about it. Once you get on the job, you're not going to get any further with it. And so what I recommend to my students is, I recommend that they read that book before they start every assignment to remind themselves of what they're going to have to be working with. 
and what practices are considered good, what practices are considered bad. And then once again before their exam. And then if they ever go for an interview that requires them to know C++, to flick through that book again because it will keep them up to date on the things that they may be asked in an interview. So these are for novices, people who are learning C++. Let's talk about something a bit more advanced because not everyone is going to be teaching people who are learning C++ for the first time. So we're going to be talking about templates. We have uh, the C++ Templates Complete Guidebook, which has just had its second edition published uh, at CppCon this year. And if you're going to be talking about the standard library, uh, this book here, which is the C++ Standard Library Tutorial and Reference, is also a good book. This one did not make it into my CppCon course because it hadn't been published at the time. This one did. And I can say that it was a really good addition. Um, so your students, if you're teaching novices, don't read these ones. If you're teaching an advanced C++ class, or you are trying to get someone up to speed on templates or on the standard library, these are two books that can, uh, can help you out. Yes, all the books that I'm listing are on this definitive guide and reference. Um, okay, I think I've forgotten the point that I was going to make, so I will just move on to the next one, which are the advanced resources for number two. If you're going to be wanting to talk about language features, then the, program, the C++ programming language is a book that you do want to be considering. You do want to be using that as your reference. Again, students do not need to read this, but you do want to make sure that you've read it. And if you're going to be talking about C++ concurrency, and I don't recommend that in a novice course, I have experience with that, it does not end well. <laughs> you can't spend two weeks on teaching concurrency. I'm sorry, it just doesn't work. Um, this book here by Anthony Williams is the only book to use for teaching concurrency with C++. And the reason I say that is because it doesn't just teach C++, it talks about how to model things concurrently as well. I've taken Anthony's course, which was, he did one better than my, uh, than my university's course, which taught C++ in two weeks. He taught it in two days. And that was a, it was, it was a real um, whirlwind for me. I wasn't able to absorb everything, but because of the book, everything fell into place over the next few weeks. And so this, these resources here are for students that are taking, not, uh, not learning how to program, not um, possibly learning things that they would uh, want to develop systems with, but maybe more advanced features. And finally, um, teacher essential resources. If you're going to be teaching C++, you really should know the history about the language. Biana's a bit of a history buff, and so he wrote a history book on C++. This goes up until about 1994, and then you can read most of the stuff online about standardization. But this book will teach you about the philosophy behind C++, why things are the way they are. People often criticize the language despite not having read this book. And d &E is the only way to understand why things were done in C++ the way they were done. It, I mean, you can talk about the other people that were involved. You could probably sit down and interview them and you'll get a similar picture, but this book is a nice, concise way to do it. The other book that I like to recommend is Elements of Programming. Again, okay. Something I need to point out is do not recommend these to a non-advanced class. <laughs> this one, you probably don't even need to recommend unless people start criticizing the language. But this one here is heavily mathematical. And it talks about how to program from a mathematical uh, perspective. It talks about what is important in a type. It talks about modeling systems, again, from a mathematical point of view. And a lot of the standard library is actually based on, or at least the standard, uh, the algorithms and, um, and containers section are based on what's, uh, what's talked about in elements of programming. This was written or co-authored by the inventor of the STL. So if you are interested in learning a bit more about what's behind the STL, uh, then elements of programming is a book for you. And finally, and this one is a point of contention, uh, if you are going to be write, uh, teaching a course and you're going to be providing your own notes, it's, probably, it's likely that they're not going to end up on this book guide and list that I've just been talking about from Stack Overflow. And if you're going to be writing a book and you want it to be of high quality, you want it to someday eventually end up on the Stack Overflow definitive book guide and list, there is one resource that you must absolutely consult whenever you write a single sentence for your resource. Behold the C++ standard. 
this is the ultimate guide for, uh, for defining what C++ is. And those books that I was talking about earlier, the ones with the glaringly factual errors, I don't know if they didn't consult this, but if they did, they grossly misunderstood what was going on in this document because there are things that they contradict from the standard. So if you're going to be writing a resource to help people understand what C++ is, do a bit of fact checking. You can get the working drafts online for free and you can talk about things. Now, if you're going to be writing a blog post, that's a bit different to writing a resource that's going to be used for educational purposes. I'm not talking about blog posts. I'm, I'm not talking about writing documentation. I'm talking about actually writing a, a book for someone to sit down and learn, uh, learn from about C++. But of course, if you want to write a blog post and then do some fact checking before you publish it, by all means, please go and read the standard. It's a very fun document to check out. Okay, so another uh, thing that we should consider are style guides. And I don't have a witty quote to talk about uh, for style guides, but I have a very pessimistic view on most style guides. The only set of guides that I really like are from the core guidelines. And the reason for that is because they don't restrict you in what you are able to do. They don't say, do not do this, except for constcast. They, the guidelines have a very, very pessimistic view on constcast and rightly so. Uh, but apart from that, they don't say never do this because this is bad. But that's what I've found in some other style guides uh, that are popular, especially with a few big companies. Uh, I'm not going to name names. But the core guidelines don't say, don't do this because it's bad style. What they say is they say, avoid doing this because of these technical reasons. It might confuse a programmer or it might be, um, it might talk about things that you don't actually want to do. It might introduce errors if you do this, or for example, always initializing variables. It, it doesn't give, just say, just do it. It says initialize a variable to ensure that it's not used uh, incorrectly. So the core guidelines are massive and you don't want to teach them. You don't want to teach them as in, you don't want to bring up the document and start going on about all, all, the, docu all the guidelines because there are just too many of them. We'll talk about tooling in a little bit. So finally, we talked about C++ reference and Stack Overflow. There are two other uh, online resources, one called Compiler Explorer. Is there anyone in the room not familiar with Compiler Explorer? Okay, how about I change the name? Please keep your hands up. Um, if you're not familiar with Compiler Explorer, are you familiar with Godbolt? Okay, so a few hands went down. Uh, for those of you, the official name is actually Compiler Explorer. Um, for the rest of you, I strongly recommend you go to godbolt.org. It's, uh, uh, it's an online com uh, compiler that doesn't run code, but what it does is it gives you the assembly app and it's a phenomenal tool. If there's time, I may be able to show you, but I don't think there will be time. Um, but uh, I, I do recommend that you check it out because it will change the way in which you write code. The other one is called OneBox, which is onebox.org. And unlike Compiler Explorer, what OneBox will do is it will compile the code and run it. If you can't do something locally for whatever reason, maybe you're on your phone, um, or you just wanna show something uh, to, to a friend and they don't have a compiler installed for whatever reason, OneBox is another great tool. And these tools are essential for learning how to program in the modern day. If you wanna write uh, an exam and have it as a lab exam, because those are the best kinds of exams for C++, uh, um, having Compile Explorer will help a student out uh, massively because we, in an exam environment, you don't get your favorite IDE. The best you might get is, uh, is Vim and Emacs. And being able to use Compile Explorer means you don't have to hit the compile button every time you make a change. Uh, the JavaScript will actually invoke it for you. So in summary, and we're gonna have to uh, blitz through this bit. I know I did uh, cover quite a lot, but we talked about online resources, uh, the C++ core guidelines as the quote style guide, unquote. Uh, we talked about using the C++ standard for fact checking, resources for teachers, advanced resources, and novice resources. So are there any comments? Simon. Effective, so the question is, what about Effective C++? And Effective C++ is on uh, the definitive, uh, uh, sorry, Stack Overflow definitive guide. But, and while it is, while Scott's books are great, they are starting to age in some areas. There are things that are in Effective STL, which is one of the books, 
that, are now, that Scott has now had to write a correction for in effective modern C++ because those things are applicable to C++ 98 and C++ 03, but not to 11 and beyond. Uh, but by all means, still continue to use effective C++, exceptional C++, and so on. Though, uh, the books by Herb and the books by Scott are incredible. Sorry, Scott and Herb. Uh, the bo those books are incredibly useful resources. But for teaching C++ as in designing a curriculum, they're, they're more useful for the guidelines on what to do. And a lot of that stuff is also encapsulated inside the <coughs> core guidelines. One of the reasons, uh, one of Scott's passing reasons was because the core guidelines encompasses a lot of the work that he's done over the years. And he feels that that is a better way to, uh, to keep his work going on. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Are there any other questions? Joe? Um, do you, well, I guess it's more of a remark, maybe half question. Um, do you not think that the fact that in the C++ world we say, read, all, read these books, is itself going to scare people away. Because a lot of other <laughs> modern languages, there's a go-to website. You yep. go to and you just learn it from there. Whereas we're still saying, go and get this you know, one paper and read it. It's not like a modern way of learning something. So do you, the... do you, recommend, do you recommend any like, like... A lot of online resources are very, like, for the already experts. Um, is there anything you know of that's good for beginners? Or? So the question slash remark is that there are, um, for other languages, a lot of online resources. For example, Rust, which is the language that I'm learning right now, has the, the official Rust documentation where they have this grand tutorial that teaches you everything. Um, and for C++, we don't have that. We still refer to books written by authors, not online stuff. And so Joe is a bit concerned that that may scare people away. And while I share, and oh sorry, and on top of that, um, we also have problems with the stuff that is online is often directed at experts already. Um, I don't know if anyone's read uh, Eric Niebuhr's blog, but that is very, very much an expert-friendly um, expert friendly blog. It's a great blog, but you need to know a lot of the things that he's already talking about ahead of time. Um, and to answer your question, Joe, I don't have an answer. <laughs> Um, I have long been trying to get something in, uh, out, of the, out of the tool shed and getting it out there for people. Uh, the biggest problem is trying to overcome, trying to talk about everything. And the authors of, the, of these grand books that we do have haven't been writing online resources. Uh, well, actually, that, that's not true. Uh, Bianca and Herb, who have both written amazing books, uh, are the editors for the core guidelines. And so they do have an online document, but they don't want that document to be read by people. They want it to be read by implementers for things, for tools. So I don't have an answer for you. And I do hope that maybe with C++ uh, practices, um, dot com, uh, uh, patterns, sorry, CPP patterns. Uh, I knew it was CPPP. Um, so with CPP patterns, um, we may be able to get some tutorials happening, maybe not through your website, but as a side effect of that. If people blog about that kind of stuff and have introductory things with the website as well, then uh, that may become something uh, that may be just a side effect. So, I mean, so it was one of the things I was thinking about when I was making CPP samples uh, patterns, mm -hmm. um, but it was the easier thing to tackle, just having patterns rather than... Uh, Yes. There's a CPP tour, which is just, it's just starting now. Yeah. CPP tour, as in .com? Uh, I think so, yeah. I'm yes. looking for people to help. Yeah, Arvid Gershman. Oh, okay. <coughs> I will look into that. Thank you. Okay, are there any other comments? One, I can take one more? No? <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so, tooling. And tooling is... Who's heard of Turbo, Turbo C++? Who thinks this statement is a good statement? Okay, so for those of you who can't see the audience because you're watching this online, uh, a few hands went up for uh, having heard Turbo C++ and every hand quickly went down as I was asking it after I'd finished asking the question about whether or not this is a good, st a good statement. Fortunately, I was missing one key part of it. If your course uses Turbo C++, immediately abandon it. 
Turbo C++ is not a C++ compiler. Despite the fact it has the word, oh sorry, the name C++ in it, it is not a C++ compiler. Who here is familiar with Shakespeare's work? I'm going to show hands, please. Who here thinks that the language which Shakespeare used, which is Elizabethan, is similar to English? Okay, similar-ish, yeah. What about if we go back a thousand years? It is the language that people spoke a thousand years before Shakespeare? Chaucer? Is it, sorry? Chaucer, is not the right thing? I'm not exactly 100% accurate on, on that. Um, but if they are speaking something remotely related to English, it would probably be close to the German in that case. And that's not English. The, I may have my dates wrong, um, but Turbo C++ diverged from C++ pre-standardization. And so if you are using a Turbo C++ compiler to teach your <coughs> students, and yes, there are still courses that use Turbo C++. I answer questions online about students who are saying, why doesn't this work in my Turbo C++ IDE? And I, I say to them, because you are using Turbo C++, which is not a C++ compiler. No, I'm not that brazen about it, but I do need to explain to them that Turbo C++ is not what they want to be using. You should not be using Turbo C++ in 2017. You shouldn't have been using it in the year 2000. So let's talk about things that are more modern. Compilers that you should be using are GCC and Clang. I'm not a fan of MSVC because it doesn't support standard C++ 11, 14, or 17. Or 98. Or 98. <laughs> Yes, I forgot about two-phase lookup. Thank you. Um, but GCC 7, in terms of core language, supports all of C++ 11, 14, and 17, and 98. Um, Clang 5, I'm not 100% sure what C++ 17 they support, but I know all the way up until 14 is supported. And I know that they already have experimental support for C++ 20. You don't have to use 7 or 5, but... We'll talk about why I prefer these two over, say, GCC 5 and Clang 3.9, which are probably much more widely available. Now, if you, are in, if you are teaching people who are at your company and you have a specific compiler, then that's an exception to the rule. I'm talking about planning a course from scratch. If you are stuck with GCC 4.9, you have my sympathy. <laughs> uh, but if that's all you have, then that's the best you can work with and you should be teaching to that compiler. But the reason I say pick at least one of is because standard C++ is supposed to be portable from compiler to compiler. And just because it works on GCC does not mean it's going to be standard C++. You need to have multiple compilers in order to verify that it's correct. So you need to get students into the mindset of if they want to write fully portable code, they need to be compiling things with multiple compilers. And this will, again, play a bit of a problem when we get to another section where this doesn't exactly play ball. So, C++ International Standard. Now we're talking about compilers. The C++ International Standard is the next big thing we need to talk about. So the very first thing that is up at the top is C++ 98 and C++ 03. Both of these are completely out of date and you should only talk about these if your company still uses C++ 98 or C++ 03. And yes, there are companies out there that still do that and there is no chance of you moving to a more modern version of C++ in the foreseeable future. On to C++ 11. I also think the C++ 11, I think it's time has come and gone. I think we need to move on to C++ 14 and C++ 17. If your company still uses C++ 11, again, there's not much you can do about it. And yes, I have to use C++ 11 at, at work as well. And I don't complain about that. Well, actually, I do complain about that. Um, just asking any of my colleagues. But I think, again, if you have the opportunity to teach something more recent, teach the more recent thing. But you'll notice that it's red, not red and crossed out. That means if you have to teach it, by all means, teach it. But try and move on to C++14. So that's the first green thing. It's not, it's not yellow, it's green, which means I know it's a bit of green on screen, but please don't start talking. Um, I think that teaching C++14 will be good until the end of 2018. In which case, you should be moving on to C++17, because it will have been out for a full year. I've been wanting to teach C++17 since March. 
which is when the standard committee decided that there's nothing else that's going to change about C++ except for editorial fixes. And we finally have a published ISO standard, but I didn't need that to teach C++ 17. It's just uh, for, for the vendors to say, yes, we implement C++ 17, finally, officially, we can say it. You need to have purchased the standard. But to teach it, I can start talking about it already, I don't, and I don't have to have that document. I don't have to pay the hundreds of dollars or pounds, sorry, um, hundreds of pounds in order to get it. I can start talking about it already. Which leads me on to my next one, which doesn't say C20, it says C next. And the next refers to whatever the current one is, plus one. So until March, that, was, that for me was C17. And now it's C20. So right now, C20 is in the red zone. But when it gets locked and is sent away for just editorial fixes, that's when it becomes an open game. And we can start teaching it then. You just need to make sure that you've got the right resources. And when a standard is very fresh, that means you're probably going to have to read the standard itself to get most of your facts. But also, talk with the people who know this sort of stuff the best. You send them an email, they're not gonna, uh, they're not gonna ignore you, they're not gonna be rude to you because you are asking them questions, they're actually gonna wanna help you learn more about what it is you are asking them to help you learn about. And you can integrate this stuff into your course. You don't have to teach it all in one go. Again, you just have to introduce a few things. For example, um, Joe, you mentioned the initializer for range four statement. That would be something that I'll be uh, I would be putting into a C++, a course that uses C++ 20 immediately because that's a feature that, uh, that is amazing. You can declare something and then uh, immediately iterate over it instead of having to declare something outside of the loop. So the next thing is technical specifications. And you can think of a technical specification if you're not familiar with it as a beta feature of C++. There's about 10 of them so far or uh, that have been published or a pending publication. And there's a few more that are in the works. And you might argue, well, because these are beta features, should we really be teaching them? In my opinion, the answer is yes, because they're not scary features. They're features that will eventually be merged in if there's enough experience with them. And the only way for people to get experience with them is for you to teach people how to use them. So the ones that I've been experimenting with are the Concepts TS and the Ranges TS, which I sadly don't have time to talk, with, talk about in much detail. But what I can confirm is that they are novice friendly if you talk about them in the right way. What I would like to find out a little bit more about is the Coroutines TS mixed with Range V3. This is a call for research and it's not a novice friendly one, in my opinion. Based on all the resources that I've seen for, for Coroutines, Coroutines are not novice friendly. Range V3, on the other hand, is just the non-concepts version of the Ranges TS. Uh, the Ranges TS does depend on the Concepts TS, so you need to teach those uh, together. Now, this goes back to when I was talking about having multiple compilers to teach, uh, to, to teach with. If you're using the Concepts TS, you can't use Clang. It's just not implemented yet. Um, if you want to use Coroutines, you can't use GCC. So that's why you have to use Range V3. If we had these three in one compiler, that would be great, but we don't. So what I think, uh, what I think you should do is, I think you should be judicial about what you do and when you introduce these features. You don't uh, throw them around and go, oh, okay, now we're going to look at something that's really, really experimental and dangerous and you shouldn't use it except in these specific circumstances. What you should do is you should just show them, should show it in use and talk about it. And then explain that it only works on one of the compilers because the other compiler hasn't gotten around to implementing it. But just like when we talk about references and we just, oh, sorry, when we talk about string uh, and we just drop that in, if we just drop in a concept and start using it, then that's great. We've already won because the students accept that it's there they accept that you're going to be using it, and this is how you use it. You don't need to get into the technical details. Finally, uh, tools. I've only taken one course that actually talks about tools and talked about them very briefly, and it wasn't the C++ course. Most of these things I've had to learn in my own time or on the job. Who uses a, who uses a debugger? Who uses a profiler? Who uses a linter such as Clang Tidy? Who uses version control? Who uses something like GitHub or GitLab, Bitbucket? Who uses a build system like CMake? Who uses continu inter continuous integration like uh, Travis CI on GitHub or Jenkins? 
So who has a tired arm right now? Okay, yeah, you can put your arms down now. Um, so for those of you who can't see, most people have their hands up at this point in time. And students need to learn about these things. So you should absolutely integrate these things into your course. What I've, uh, what I've been trying to experiment with, experiment with is putting them into the parts of the course that actually, um, that actually kind of make it with the project kind of work. But I don't have time to talk about that. So I just wanna call for asking people to put this sort of stuff into their courses. So we've talked about tools a little bit. We've talked about technical specifications and how they can be integrated. Uh, we've talked about which standards should be uh, taught and which compilers you ought to use. Hint, please don't use Turbo C++. Are there any remarks on this section? Okay, so your hand went up first. Um, how do you deal with the fact that when you teach people C++, compared to some other languages, mm -hmm. it really feels like it's in the works, like it's fragmented this. So if you want to use that feature, you can even run just, oh, it's not merged in yet, and that kind of thing. Yep. Uh, where some other languages will just say Python 2 or 3, and that's it, and just think about 3. Okay, so the question is, how do we deal with the fragmentation of the language in, uh, with respect to features that may be in uh, C++ 11 or 14, or uh, with uh, as opposed to Python 2 or Python 3, where it's just a feature in one or the other? And my answer to that is, I'm going to quickly uh, tackle Python, but then I'm going to move on to Java, which I know much more than Python. Um, the, the answer to Python is, we have Python 2.7, Previously, there was Python 2.6 and so on. And I'd be very surprised if Python 3 is just an integral number. No, it's 3, 5, 3, 7 as well. So that's still, that's still fractured. Uh, it's just the idea that you're scaring people away already when you just start talking instead of, you know, when, when back when it was C++11 mostly, it was fairly easy. You're on C++11, you're not. Mm -hmm. And now you're just expanding the number of factors. So I think that changes the question in that you're now talking about talking about C++11, talking about C++14, talking about the Rangers TS. When you're teaching people about this sort of stuff, you don't mention that. You just talk about C++ as a, an atomic sort of system, and these are the features that they use. And you don't talk about these things that are coming. And I've seen that done in courses, and that doesn't really work out too well. So does that answer the question? Yep. Okay, I've got time for one other remark. Uh, like you're talking about the C++ standard as yep. a reference thing. Uh, but my understanding was that it was mostly for implementers. Yep. Uh, it doesn't really tell you how to use things. And like, if you want to know the how to use things, you want to look at the papers. Yes. That, not this, not the wording, but the papers themselves. Is the papers a better reference to know how to use C++ than the standard itself? So the, so the, the, the question is, uh, should you look at proposals over the standard because the standard is for implementers? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So if you're a teacher and solely a teacher, then the standard may not be the tool for you. If you're writing a book on, on C++, then you need to make sure that your facts are going to be correct because a teacher can always go away and look things up. But once your publication hits print, that's it. Uh, you now need to uh, provide error type. You do need to provide other things in order to correct those things and not everyone's going to get access to that. You can always, as a teacher, say at the front of the class, yep, I made a mistake. But you can't do that when you have a, when you have a physical book that's been printed and there is a factual error, error in that. As for checking a paper, that's good for checking the motivation and the use case, but things may change from proposal to standard. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Sure. Okay, um, if anyone does have questions after, uh, other than this, I'm sorry, I do need to press on to content to address, which I will blitz through and then move on to content to avoid. So, um, we have this thing called auto, which talks about type deduction. We code against interfaces, not against implementations. And Herb Sutter in 2014 gave a CPP con talk where he talked a lot more in detail about this. I was never planning to talk too much about this, but yes, I do recommend using auto on the left-hand side and having this on the right-hand side because it makes sure that you are, first of all, this is always going to be initialized because I can put int i and then semicolon. I can't forget the value on the right-hand side. Secondly, the compiler will always know what the, what the type is better than you. If I put something that's bigger than an int over here, things can, go, things can go wrong. If I put something that's bigger than int here with auto and not int, then the compiler will automatically go, well, this can't be an int, maybe I'll try a long. Oh, okay, the size of an int and a long are the same on this architecture, so I'll move on to long long. 
that's, uh, that's something to consider. But I do recommend you go and watch Herb Sutter's talk. Uh, it's called Back to the Basics, Modern Essentials of C++ Design, I think. Um, but if you look that up on YouTube, you will find it. So, technical terms. Quickly, can someone define what an object is, please? An object in C++, that is. Joe? Region of memory. So it's technically a region of memory associated with a type. Um, that is the definition of an object. Please get that correct. Uh, base class and derived class, not subclass and superclass. Uh, that does get confusing when you start talking about subobjects, which is a technical term in C++. Similarly, member function and function, not methods, please. That's just another technical term. Um, implementation defined behavior. Don't talk about implementation defined behavior unless you're in, in, unless you are in a class. Don't talk about it directly. The same goes for unspecified behavior and undefined behavior. And yes, I know these are all misspelled. It's American spelling, but that's because that's what the standard actually has. Oh, it's changing? Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, I, it pained me to take the use out when I was making this slide. Um, you do talk about these, but you don't talk about them to novices as these three terms. What you say is that in GCC, an int might be, some, might be one size and in Clang it might be another. Or if you move to ARM instead of x86, then the sizes change because different, uh, different hardware manufacturers like to have different sizes because of the different requirements that their clients have. For unspecified behavior, you just say, well, this, uh, this particular feature isn't exactly the same because different people have different ideas about it. And undefined behavior, you don't say that nasal demons uh, shoot out of your nose. Um, what I used to say is that Donald Trump would win the US election, and then when that happened, I think I woke up with about 80 emails in my inbox asking me who divided by zero. <laughs> I was not impressed. Um, undefined behavior is simply a design error. That's it. That's all you have to say. It's a design error, and you talk about how we have design errors and how we want to avoid those, and if we avoid design errors, then we avoid undefined behavior. So now we have the standard continuous library. And I put the word continuous there because you shouldn't be talking about the standard library in a discrete format at the end of your course. It should be flowing throughout the, throughout the book. And this is one of the things that I do wish that uh, the Swan book had done a bit differently. It talks about uh, parts of the standard library uh, continuously, and that's great. But then it also introduces other things, such as what I've got on screen at the very end of the book. So what does the first example, so what does that do? Duncan, is it a bubble sort? Can I get a show of hands, people who think it's a bubble sort? How many of you agreed with that after Duncan had asked that question? Okay, so a few nodding heads. All right, so it is a bubble sort. And how many of you had to stop and read that code? How many of you can say with certainty that the code is correct? No one. Okay, what is the second line of code? What's that one do? Peter, you can't say anything because you're the one that gave me the idea. Simon. So it's a counting function, checks the number of uh, elements that match some foo object. Okay, so who, how many of you had to read that code and digest what that one did? How many of you are certain that is correct? Okay, I see two hands. That's two more than the bubble sort. What about this? How many of you have to digest what's happening on this line? Or is the name self-explanatory? What about standard count? Now you might be asking, well, what about this begin and end? Uh, do, do I really need to be doing that? Well, if you start using the ranges TS, you don't have to be doing that. And that's why teaching the ranges TS is beautiful because you now eliminate the begin and end, you, t you totally wipe out the iterators component and you just start using containers, or ranges, as they're called. Now, if you're going to be talking about programming, I have to give a shameless plug to my company. Um, Codeplay and Sickle, oh, sorry, Sickle is something that Codeplay works with, and if you're going to talk about uh, parallel programming, I strongly recommend you consider Sickle. Now, hopefully I didn't destroy your eyes. Um, graphics. I, I really enjoyed Rachel's talk because it had graphics in it and it was very visually engaging. And as, as a human, I really like in, uh, being engaged visually. And graphics are a way of showing off the cool things about C++. Um, now you don't have to start talking about OpenGL, you don't have to start talking about, um, about raycasting, you can just show a GUI. But, you, but Bianna talked about this at CppCon, 
But if you just start talking about all the textual stuff that C++ can do, people are going to get bored. So I strongly recommend that you look into GUIs, maybe not Qt. Uh, Biana talks about using FTLK, which apparently is a lighter <laughs> toolkit than, um, than using uh, something such as Qt. But it's just something to consider. It's also a great way of talking about object-oriented programming. And then we finally have generic programming, which is something that's very important for modern programming because then you can uh, better, have better code reuse. Now, very quickly, content to avoid. C slash C++. <laughs> this is a terrible term that goes back to C++ is C with classes. I don't have time to expand on this, unfortunately. So we'll move on to spot the problem one. This is some content that I've seen in teaching resources. The slide is not green, but please feel free to raise your hand and point out the problem. Simon. You be where? Everywhere. So <laughs> the, the answer was undefined behavior. Where? Everywhere. And it's the fact that we have an increment and a, a pre-increment uh, or a post-increment in multiple spots. We are writing to an object twice in the same, uh, without having some sort of sequence uh, between them. So if you have this sort of stuff in your teaching material, eliminate it. It is incorrect. Show plus plus I on one thing and don't talk about I plus plus at all. As C++ programmers, that is toxic in most cases. Spot the problem too. Simon, so, mean, you've already answered this in a previous talk. You can't answer it. Um, which one is correct? Which one is incorrect? And why? Yep. The one on the left is incorrect because we are doing a flush, which we don't need to do. Yeah, so the answer is... The, uh, the one on the left is incorrect because we're using endl, which serves as a new line and a flush, and we only really wanted to print a new line. Well, in this case, right to the character output. And it's character output, not, uh, not console output. That's another gripe of mine. Um, but using endl is incorrect in almost all cases. You very rarely want to be doing a flush. You want to be using backslash n because that's the correct way. And that's actually something that I look for in books when evaluating their, uh, their, their correctness. If a book says, not, not if a book uses Endel. If a book uses Endel, fine, they may be mistaken. But if a book says that Endel is a universal flush, sorry, a universal new line sequence, then it is lying to you because this is the universal end of line sequence. This does backslash N and then immediately flushes. It's actually, you're not having to do two function calls as opposed to one. And also, I know there's no return zero here, main doesn't need a return zero. Okay, spot the problem three. If you find the bug, raise your hand. I don't have a lot of time, so when someone spots it. So it's um, checking the stream and then reading into it, but the, um, the input into i might fail and you've not checked it. That's correct. So the problem is that we are doing while not in.eof up here and then reading in down here, which means this check is actually useless. You don't do that. Uh, what you do want to do is this. So what we do here is the first thing we do is we open the file. If the file doesn't open for whatever reason, then it immediately goes down to here and, uh, with the failure, which is essentially what we've done here, but in one fewer step. Um, then what we do is we declare our thing in, an, in some loop and we read it in. That's it. It's that simple. Then we, print, then we write it to the character output. And then once it leaves that section, uh, what we need to do is we check if it's bad. And if it's bad, that means that there's a, a non-recoverable uh, error that's happened. Usually that means that something's disconnected. For example, you know, you've disconnected the hard drive while you're, while you're writing to that. That's one example. Another thing is that we have, uh, so we have fail. But the problem is that we need to also check that it's not the end of file uh, because end of file also sets fail. So what we do here is we say that some sort of non-integral data has been read because we are trying to read an integer. If we read in a, uh, a character, for example, that's going to cause problems. But that's a recoverable error. So it's a fail failure, not bad. Uh, and then we just have this uh, error handling here. We're, okay, so spot the problem four. Uh, there's no problem there. I mixed that one up. 
Okay, <laughs> spot the problem five. Yep. So the answer was, is there an overflow of the minimum integer? The answer is yes, that is, uh, that is definitely possible. And that wasn't what I was actually going for. But that's a very good observation that I overlooked. Code doesn't match the docs. Yeah. Code doesn't match the doc? <laughs> okay, that's... Okay, uh, let's pretend the doc doesn't exist then. Um, so I argue that, uh, like a lot of people in the standard uh, committee, uh, that we should not be using unsigned integers for arithmetic purposes. We should be using it for bitwise purposes. This is a hotly contend, uh, contended thing, but um, when you have a bit pattern, that's all you have, a bit pattern. You don't get the, uh, the negative, uh, you don't get negative values. And you may argue, well, what if I don't need those? Maybe I can just use an unsigned integer, but then you can't compare it against a signed integer. You need to convert one of them. And when you need to convert one of them, which one do you convert? And I've had people argue, well, you convert whichever one's most appropriate. If you're just contrasting two numbers to see if one is greater than the other, you can't just say, well, whichever one's most appropriate, because if one's negative and one's positive, well, one has to be positive because it's the unsigned integer, but if, uh, one is, if the other one's negative, then it doesn't make sense to convert one because you might have uh, the conversion do the wrong thing. So I argue for arithmetic purposes, use integer. If you wanna talk about that, uh, we need to talk about it offline. The other thing I wanna address is template code bloat. It's a myth. If you optimize your code and you absolutely should be optimizing your code, template code bloat does disappear. People who argue that it doesn't disappear, I suggest go to Compiler Explorer and take a look at watching that, uh, that extra code just magically vanish when you turn on even 01. Okay. So we have an insertion sort here, or at least an insertion sort for some definition of insertion sort. Essentially what's happening is we have an un, a range of unknown size. Now we're getting this from a network, so we, don't act, we can't actually query the size. Uh, but what we're doing is we're, ins we're trying to find the place to insert it um, after finding it. What container should we be using the insertion sort? We'll assume that the size of the range is also on the order of several million. Can I get a show of hands, please, for the first option, forward list? No one. What about second option, uh, just list, which is a doubly linked list? No one. What about deck? Again, no one. Multiset. One, two, how about vector? A few hands. Who's not sure? Who wants a bit more time? Who would like a drink? Okay. Um, so those of you who put your hand up for vector, vector is the correct answer. Uh, the reason for that is because vector has contiguous memory, whereas a, uh, a linked list has to traverse through random points in memory. Uh, that's similar for multiset, which is a uh, which is a binary search tree in most cases, which means you have to be jumping um, from uh, point to point. Um, other people who are much smarter than me have given uh, more comprehensive answers. Both Beyond Strutstrup and Chandler Carruth have given this, uh, this talk uh, many times, so I suggest you check out their talks. So, content to avoid and to address, we, don't, we should not populate, sorry, we should not perpetuate popular myths. We shouldn't refer to either C or C++ as C slash C++. We should teach generic programming, graphics, parallel programming. We should teach the standard library in our entire course. We should make sure that we have terminology that's appropriate for our audience. And finally, type deduction. We need to talk about type deduction as well. And this slide is not gonna go green because it will destroy your eyes. Um, but if anyone wants to raise questions, uh, right now is the time to do so. Otherwise, I will quickly hit the next button. So the question is, should the standard library have um, some sort of GUI, uh, GUI framework? That's not something that I'd like to answer online. I think it's something we should talk about at the pub. 
Uh, and the reason for that is because that's not to do with teaching. Sorry. Are there any other questions? Rachel? In one of the examples, you used um, uh, not, but not as just an exclamation mark, but as the actual keyword not. As in NOT. That's yep. unusual in my experience. Okay, so the reason I use it, and I, I do flick between the two. Um, is it this one? Yes. Okay, so we have not here. So the reason I use that there is because it reads better to me. So I say not, uh, so is not open is the way I can read that. Whereas exclamation mark, I need to pass that differently. Now, when I was learning mathematics in, at uni, my professor for calculus and for discrete maths said that we write mathematics for humans. And so every symbol that we introduce is something that we need to spend time passing. And that's why I use not. I don't use the words and and or as much as I do not, but not to me reads easier than exclamation mark. And I have had a few discussions with colleagues about the uh, validity of exclamation mark versus not. Does that sort of address what you're talking about? Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, for graphic things, like we kind of brushed on it, but yep. which one do you? Uh, which library do you like to use? I remember, I think it was a talk by Herb, which we are talking about uh, things like Cinder, which are kind of easier to grapple with and are not like just to design a desktop application, but like do like fancy graphic stuff. Is it the kind of thing that you would be using or, or do you have a preferred one? I, um, so PPP or um, Programming Principles and Practice uses FTLK. And so that's the one that I recommend because I do recommend using that book. I don't have much experience with, uh, with GUI frameworks as a whole. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Sure. Are there any other questions? No? All right. So learning C++ isn't difficult. It's teaching that's a trick.